Uh, we want to bring in Brian Norcross for his analysis. He's a hurricane specialist attending the National Tropical Weather Conference in South Padre Island. Brian, thank you. Colorado State, of course, this above average. Wondering your, uh, your initial reaction. No surprise, I'd imagine. No surprise at all, actually. And if you think about it, last year we had 20 named storms. And last year we had an El Nino, and an El Nino tends to decrease the number of uh, storms that can develop in the Atlantic. The El Nino condition, of course, being in the Pacific. So if you start with an Atlantic water temperature profile that is like last year or maybe even a little more extreme than last year, and then you take away the uh, diminishing effect of the El Nino, you got to get more. And I was a little surprised, to be honest with you, that uh, Phil Klotzbach and the team at Colorado State didn't go with perhaps 25 or some number like that. Now, they do put out a range uh, this year, 19 to 27, as their name number of named storms. Uh, I mean, as I said, I thought maybe they would go just a little bit uh, higher because there is nothing that is on, on a macro level that would uh, imply anything but a busy season, although that's, of course, never 100% uh, for sure uh, when we look at it in the spring. Yeah, that's true. Brian, I've got one question for you. We're start, we started naming subtropical storms a couple of decades ago. Do you think that's playing any role at all in the number of our named storms that keep on going up every year? Well, a little bit, uh, Bob, but it also has to do with technology. You know, the, the definition of what a tropical storm is hasn't changed, but the fact that we can see with advanced radar and now when we fly airplanes into the storms, they have three radars on some of them. Uh, we really can see what's going on inside the storm and, of course, the high-resolution satellites. We can see uh, all kinds of details we couldn't see before. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing short-lived storms that would never have been named before because we wouldn't have had the data to be able to realize that it actually does meet the criteria to get a tropical storm name. That's also true of, of subtropical storms to some degree. So I don't think it's, it's uh, you know, it's certainly nothing nefarious. It's really no. got to do with right. modern technology and our ability to monitor the atmosphere is, is just... Uh, uh, the fact that we can do it in more detail now than we right. could yeah, fascinating. Uh, a couple decades ago. Mm -hmm. And Brian, you, you talked even yesterday with Phil Klotzbach and, and talking and looking at this this forecast. I, I believe this is the, the, the 40th season. Is that is that correct of this forecast? Explain to it, because there are some critics, and I know you talked to Phil about it, how we're so early. Why, why offering a forecast like this as a preparedness tool, as an informational tool? I, I mean, preparedness should year-round be, be the same, regardless of the time of year. Yeah, you know, it's a really interesting philosophical uh, question. And uh, before I answer that exactly, Stephen, let me give you another example. When spaghetti models first came out, I was really opposed to spaghetti models, and I never showed them on TV <laughs> because I thought they were confusing, and it was like a bunch of information that really didn't advance what we were trying to communicate. But then when they're distributed everywhere and everybody can look at them and, and they, really, they really are confusing, I thought, okay, we got to put them on TV so we can talk about it and really talk about what it all means at, at a scientific level and, and you know, what does it add or doesn't add to the information that you're getting. And, of course, now uh, it's just part of the, the conversation. So because people start getting geared up emotionally and, and they should physically – this time of year, I think net net that these forecasts are good. It gets us focused on uh, hurricanes and the hurricane threat earlier in the year when, you know, I've been around long enough to remember when nobody even thought about it until June. So this is it is important for people to think about it here in uh, April. And because there, there are preparation steps, including getting the shutters or whatever in place that people need to get in place that they might not have uh, at this point. You can't just snap your fingers and, and make that kind of thing happen. So net net, I think it's a good thing. Yeah, that's a, that's one thing. You're in South Padre, uh, Texas right now, and I, I can't help but think of last season. Bob, you sort of brought this up. Um, the Atlantic season last last year featured a bunch of storms that remained out in the Atlantic. We what, Was it just two systems that were in the Gulf of Mexico? Harold making that landfall in, in South Texas and then I, Idalia? I, can, can we at all infer 
if if the Gulf of Mexico, where the, the hot zones might be this season, mm -hmm. El Nino transitioning now to La Nina, that might play a role? Well, two points. One is that uh, generally with the way Colorado State forecasts it is they say if the season is 50 percent higher than average, the landfalls uh, will we'll, we'll put a percentage on them 50 percent higher than average. So they don't do a, a lot of uh, magic about that. So if you take all that into account, you have a very high chance of a landfall in the continental U.S. this year just based on the fact there are more storms in the Atlantic. However, when you have an El Nino like we did last year, generally the weather pattern keeps storms offshore. Uh, the odds are about 10% uh, lower of having a storm uh, make landfall. In other words, make it past 60 degrees, which is about where the, the islands are. Uh, more storms turn north out into the Atlantic when there is an El Nino. When there's a La Nina, on the other hand, you have more storms come farther west on average. It's about a plus or minus 10% kind of thing. So uh, the, the, the weather pattern that turned all those storms you can see on your map there up into the middle of the Atlantic, one would think on average would not be as likely this year as it was last year. So uh, indications would be that we would have uh, a higher likelihood of a landfall somewhere in the U.S., somewhere in the Caribbean, somewhere in the islands. Uh, something like that, gen just generally with a weather pattern shift. Now, let me add that this this distribution of warm water that, uh, you know, we've been showing mm -hmm. right. forever, right, because it's been so exceptionally warm in the Atlantic, is really different than, than what we've seen in the past, having that exceptionally warm water across the tropics and across the eastern Atlantic, and how that it was going to affect the average weather pattern and maybe affected the average weather pattern last year is not at all clear. Mm -hmm. And exactly what's causing that is not clear. Mm -hmm. I've talked to a lot of scientists at um, the hurricane conferences I've been at and the meteorology conferences this spring, and nobody really has an understanding of the cause and effect of that distribution of very warm water. Because, as you know, the, the temperature of the water and the way the winds flow are interrelated. Right. So uh, we're a little bit in uncharted territory here. In fact, we're a lot in uncharted territory in terms of trying to compare this season to past seasons uh, because of that very unusual distribution of uh, very warm water in the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly seems from the initial thoughts, Colorado State University issuing that first forecast, it looks to be a, a very active season. 23 named storms yeah. are going for, 11 of which becoming hurricanes, five majors. Brian Norcross, Fox Weather Hurricane Specialist, thanks for joining us on the conversation. Good to see you. Enjoy that time down in South right, Padre. Good to see you. Thanks.